Hey, what's going on guys? It's Chris Daniels here, AKA CD Playa. Thought it'd be a good day to come outside and film a little bit. It's just so beautiful here today. It's a little cold, so I have my jacket on, but this might be more interesting than me just sitting out into a really dark room, okay? So first, I know that there was some interest in learning more about my own fingerboard history. I may split this into multiple parts just because there's so much that I could cover. So without further ado, we'll jump right into it. Before we jump in to my own personal history with fingerboarding, I think we need to go rewind back in time. My love for fingerboarding probably came out of my love for skateboarding first. When I was a little kid, probably around three or four years old, there was a cartoon that many people from my age would know, and that is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Back then, Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, and Leonardo, those were the turtles, and they all were really cool at the time, and it was like the biggest cartoon. Anyway, those characters loved to do fun 80s stuff, and one of the things that they did was skateboard. So I actually had some action figures of like Michelangelo and Raphael and they both had skateboards and I just love playing with those toys so much and watching the cartoons of them skateboarding. Then fast forward about a year from that point and the movie Hook was released. This was back in like 1991, 1992. For those of you that don't know what the movie Hook is, it stars Robin Williams who is an older Peter Pan. So it tells the story about how an old grown-up version of Peter Pan who lives in the real world has to go back to Never Neverland because Captain Hook captured or kidnapped his children. Well in the movie there is a scene where the Lost Boys are skateboarding on these makeshift like bamboo skateboards. But we actually ended up loving that movie so much and watched it so many times that my parents bought us some action figures and we ended up getting two different action figures, both of which had these little skateboard accessories that came along with it. So we love playing with those toys so much. And actually we lost the action figure, so we would use the skateboard with our own fingers and pretend we were skateboarding. Now, back then I was not a fingerboarder. I did dink around with the toy and ride like this, but I wasn't doing any tricks, maybe throwing it up into the air or using it in the sink but I wasn't a fingerboarder at that time. Then you had in 1995, the X Games get onto ESPN and really make a huge impact across, I think, that whole generation. I used to watch the X Games to watch the skateboarders compete as well as rollerbladers and BMXing. Well then Tony Hawk ended up landing that 900 and the hype was real and huge and skateboarding's popularity just blew up. This actually, helped in my own personal love for skateboarding as well. I used to love watching those sports and really impacted me. My neighbor had a brother who was about, I don't know, 15 years older than him. And he actually had two different skateboards that we used to ride all the time. One was a Christian Hasoy and the other one was a Mark Gatorigowski deck. Those were like so much fun to ride. They were the hammerhead shapes, they're super heavy. And we try to learn how to do tricks on them that we would see in like skateboard magazines and on on espn and i would do this ollie where i basically just alternated my left and right foot so fast that the board would come off the ground like this much um and then we would try to do like pop shovets and stuff and that was like just so integral in me loving skateboarding so far i haven't really touched too much on fingerboarding because the root of my passion and experience with fingerboarding was through skateboarding. Well, fast forward to 1998. In the summer, I was at a Stanford swim camp and I just hear this clicking noises that's going on in our bunk room. I round the corner and there's a group of like four or five kids just huddled around, flicking this miniature skateboard off the ramp. I later would find out that that was the tech deck blue street box that they had. It had like the bank, a quarter pipe, a bank with a rail, and then the stair set with the two rails on the side. I remember thinking how cool it looked and I really want to try this, but you know, only have 15 minutes until practice and it looks like they're all taking up all that space and it's too crowded, so whatever. So now it's the end of August and the first day of school is here and I just see those toys everywhere. It was kind of like the Pokemon fad, like it was all throughout the school. Every kid, boy and girl, 
had tack decks. They were all over the place. So that night after swim practice, I pleaded my mom to drive us to Toys R Us where I picked up two different tack decks. The first was a New Deal and the second was a real skateboard. It was interesting because back then there was no media that you could access readily for fingerboarding. There was skateboard videos that we had of VHSs and back then you had like the Dark Star video, you had um, Fulfilled the Dream by Shorties, Rodney Mullen versus Daywan Song. All those kind of influenced us both in skateboarding as well as fingerboarding. We didn't have any other medium to tell us how to fingerboard. At least at that age, I didn't know of any. So we were just figuring out how to fingerboard. We would tap the tail like this with our hands off, tap the tail with our finger here, and then learn how to control the board different ways. We learned how to ollie, pop shove it that way. We even learned how to do kick flips and heel flips and 360 flips. And that was like a lot of our friend group was learning through just our own style and develop this technique. Well, in 1999, there was two VHS tapes that were released by Tech Deck that featured fingerboarding. The first was Fingers of Fury, and the second was Flying Fingers. So we saw these pioneer fingerboarders, Damian Bernadette, Tony Potex, Matt Johnson, and Darren Langhorse fingerboard, and it just blew our minds what was possible. We learned that maybe we should just have our fingers on the board at the beginning to pop a deck and do tricks. We also saw that you could do nolly and switch tricks, and it just really changed our perspective on everything. From that point on, like the whole paradigm that we had was just shifted in our brain about fingerboarding. It was also during this time that the internet was like just starting to get popular. Um, at this point, I had made some websites uh, for Dragon Ball Z and for Pokemon back in 1997, 1998. So I already knew how to use Yahoo back then and Jeeves and all S.com or whatever. And I went on, I had an Angel Fire website already and a GeoCities website. And I was like, well, you know, I wonder if there's any websites devoted to fingerboarding. And I did find some initially. Uh, one, one of the first ones was the fingerboard.com community, which became later known as techdex.com. And that had the old skater die forum. It also had a chat room. It had a rankings of the best fingerboarders in the world where you could submit your video clips and have them ranked on the forum, and then they would update that list. Additionally, they had some multimedia stuff. They had links out to new websites. So things were not really consolidated back then, but it was really like this wild west frontier like of trying to like see what was even out there. And you would uncover a new website that would give you some tips and techniques or some new ramps that you were dreaming of. So when I initially joined the Skater Dive forums, I just lurked hard. I maybe had like two posts for like the first five or six months. But then I befriended a guy named Dustin Tice who was on the, who was actually spamming the chat room. And I spent like two and a half hours chatting with him. We ended up getting each other's like AOL instant messenger screen names and became like really good buds. And then I started feeling more comfortable, started to post under my username, which actually was not CD Playa. It was Crisco D, C-R-I-S-Q-O-D. And then later it became Crisco D123 because I forgot my password. So that was actually CD Playa before CD Playa was Crisco D. And you know, these times we didn't have great cameras. We didn't have phones. You had to use these digital camcorders or handy cams. Or if you had analog, you had to use like a capture device to even get your footage into your computer. It was really high barrier to entry back then to even get video clips up. I was lucky that my neighbor who actually lives through these woods over here had a mini DV cam that was a digital camcorder that was pretty decent quality. We made a skateboard slash fingerboard video together. I don't have the actual part that we made, but I have some clips of his and some clips of mine, which I'm sure you've seen before if you've been on my channel. This was back in 1999. We were just copying what we saw those fingerboarders do, and it really was a fun time period. Now the barrier to entry was pretty difficult. So to even get your footage uploaded online, you had to sign up for a web host. Once you had your web host, you could upload a file, and that could take a while because our internet was so slow back then. Like it would take you hours to get a single trick clip back in like 2000 onto the internet. 
and they would be so grainy and so tiny on the screen. So the coat quality was terrible too. And then even if you could get it onto your host, you had to take that link for that specific file and add it into like the forum post. And it's not like there was a thumbnail and people didn't really know what they were gonna watch. They would click on that link. It would take hours for that trick to download. And then sometimes it wasn't what you expected. The internet was the wild west back then. There was some great websites around that time. There was Moshmallows by Gary Moyer who had the best DIY content out there. There was Hydraulic Wheels. Ed from Hydraulic had some fantastic tips and techniques too. And then there was also Double Jointed. Actually, wait. Yeah, Double Jointed Fingerboarding, who had so many innovative techniques, including his single jointed trucks that he made, which were probably one of the first single axle trucks that were out there. He would take Tech Deck trucks, drill through the hanger, implement a single axle in and then connect that together. This was back in like 2000, 2001. There was so much going on back then. For me, I was still very shy on the internet. I did post still, um, but I wasn't super active. Eventually techdex.com was shut down. I think it was in March of 2021. It might've been a little bit before that. Yeah, I think it was actually like December of 2020 and then techdex.com took that over and three months later, release the techdeck.com forum, which actually was a really cool community. The only problem was that it was like so many young kids and trolls on there that the content was wild. Like really difficult to have a nice functioning conversation because it was just spammed to death. There was like community of fingerboarders that were a little bit more hardcore than the techdeck.com fingerboarders. And I was one of them. So what happened then was Rodrigo Ortiz created a site called Fingerboard Jabber and on there was a message board that only lasted about three or four months. So it really did not have a huge impact overall on fingerboarding. But for that time period, it was the place to go if you were like a decent fingerboarder, at least in the English speaking realm. After that, we were lucky to have Ben Udidam Mist and Jamie the Switch Kid Quist um, come up and step up and have fingerboarders.net, which honestly was such a cool community for the, for the time. They had this beautiful flash website, a great community ranking system, nice forum and chat room. And I just really wish that would have stuck around, but unfortunately that ended up closing down in 2002. So we were going from place to place to place and I was still pretty shy. So I was just kind of a lurker then. Well, that all changed in 2003. This is actually when I got really active in posting videos and content. That was when the advent of RZF, which was Red Zone Fingerboards, had a forum on there, which was more the hardcore user base. And then there was FFI, which is Finger Flip Inc., which was like in between tacdac.com and RZF forums, where you had like people that acted older than this crowd, but were not as hardcore and elitist as the RZF crowd. And during that time period, I really started posting a lot. People really started to know who I was. I was considered an OG of the time since I knew about all the early days in 1999, 2000s online scene back then. Cause I was, even though I just lurked, I retained a lot of that information and shared it. And I was a good fingerboarder for the time. So those two communities were really fun to be a part of. During this time I was on a company called Vegas Fingerboards, which had a kind of a couple of videos that came out that people really enjoyed and those full length videos were like lights out and form of sin um, it was more of stair sets and handrails type of type of tricks big gaps definitely similar to what was going on in skateboarding back then you had the hash versus fresh crowd and debate that would happen between that people who liked tech and clean tricks versus people who liked gnarly gaps, rails, and whatever, and just having some style even if this trick was sketchy. So that was a very fun time period for me. I ended up having a couple parts that I was really proud of and even still to this day that I really love to watch. And then in 2005, I ended up going to college and taking a hiatus from fingerboarding for a while actually. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One, I was just so focused on school and life. And two, it was, 
fingerboarding didn't feel as challenging or as magical to me and I'm sure everyone goes through that. I go through that on phases but I always know it's there for me. It's a hobby that I can always go back to and try out something new. And I think uh, with that this is a good time to stop with part one. We'll pick up with part two and that time period will be probably around early 2007 until maybe let's say 2013 which was like a very integral part of my fingerboarding time.